Uh, thank you so much for coming. I know it's late in the day. Uh, from the looks on your faces, you guys look as tired as I am. So I don't know, hopefully you make it to the uh, event tonight if you, uh, if you signed up to go to that. I'm super excited about my panelists today, two that I've spent some time with before uh, talking with on my uh, OpenStack OS podcast, and uh, a new one who, uh, who I can't wait to hear more from. And so we wanted to do a, a panel that uh, really just talks to users who've been doing OpenStack for a while. Because coming into the fray, you know, there's a lot of uh, options and, and ways to consume OpenStack. These are three folks who have spent a tremendous amount of time uh, building and operating and deploying at scale for production workloads. So I'm going to let you all introduce yourself. Subu? Hi there. Um, my name is Subu Alamaraju. I've been at eBay for the last four years. We have uh, been earlier adopters of OpenStack from 2012 have, I think, uh, one of the largest deployments now in production for three years. Have the experience of uh, failures and success with OpenStack, so we can talk about everything. And is, <laughs> just in case you didn't notice, this is his fan section here in the front. These are the guys who make it work, so. Good. Hello, my name is Yad Kusman. I'm senior vertical architecture of key systems subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom, and we are working for enterprise and business customers of Deutsche Telekom. We have various um, OpenStack installations and runtime, and uh, a few months ago I left the Deutsche Telekom and we started working with OpenStack there in 2012. Uh, my name is Edgar McGenna. I work for Wordy, uh, almost a year and a half. Uh, Wordy has been investing in OpenStack for almost two years now. We have a production system. Uh, we're moving all the bare metal system into the cloud um, in both virtual machines and containers. Uh, my team is not here, so I don't have a huge crowd, but I'm going <laughs> to expect Nikki to get me. There you are. There you are. That's what I'm talking about. And, um, I'm wearing two hats all the time, which I love it. Um, it's a, a user on OpenStack, and also I'm still a core developer for Neutron, so you have some complaints about that. So I wait you at the end of the Target session. Target practice, <laughs> right there, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, each of you have, uh, you are doing very different things with, with OpenStack, most definitely. Um, Edgar, I know your deployment is relatively newish. You've been building it for some time. You have been running uh, for a while at scale, and then you're working on a combination of both kind of public cloud infrastructure and then private as well. Tell us a little bit more about what you're actually doing with OpenStack. And I'll start with you, Sue. Yeah. So we started uh, uh, with a, a multi-tenant model uh, early on, uh, where uh, we, we support multiple uh, types of workloads on the same uh, cloud infrastructure. The, the, the promise that we had and the principle we had was you run a cloud in a shared infrastructure for multiple business units so that you, you can get the most efficiencies, get consistent experience, and, and feature parity across different types of workloads. That has been the promise, and uh, uh, we started with our own uh, distribution from GitHub, and we packaged and rolled it out. We built automation over a number of years. It's still ongoing because there are always rough edges to polish. Uh, I mean, it's been serving production traffic. It's been serving dev test traffic for a number of years. Uh, the the promise of cloud as a self-service uh, uh, API-driven um, uh, consumption has succeeded uh, to a large extent. We still have a lot more to do, a uh, lot more to improve uh, security, uh, availability, and, and things like that. But it has been a, a fun yet challenging ride with OpenStack. At the last time I talked to you, I can't remember how many VMs you were running, so it was a crazy number of VMs. Are, are you able to share how many VMs I, you're running now? I think, I think today at a point, we are at a point where it doesn't really matter. Uh, because, yes. because I think the, the reason I say it is that, is that when it comes to, one, once you find a pattern that is repeatable and multi, you can multiply it a number of times, and you can grow the number as long as there's a business driver for that, but also we also worry about efficiencies and consumption and things like that. So it's not about numbers game as far as we are concerned. It's more about uh, getting the service to the customer. What are you doing with your OpenStack? Good. Uh, 
uh, we have various installations. So uh, the first time we are part of the global uh, system intercard network. Uh, we are responsible currently for the deployment of the, the projects on, on the European part of the uh, system intercard. Um, this is an offering targeting big customers, enterprise customers, and small, medium-sized enterprises as well. Um, on, the, on the other hand, we are currently working on a project with, with Huawei on, um, on the CO 2016. We will um, present our, our work together with Huawei, and it will be in private, uh, public, um, low-cost iOS hardware. And on the Deutsche Telekom side, we have um, an installation for a software as a service offering. And the platform below this software as a service offering for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, is an open stack platform uh, trying to do it yourself or for our own distribution of open stack. And then we have multiple development platforms inside Deutsche Telekom running on open stack with different players, different um, distribution. And Edgar? So we're going to start saying what Wordig is. It's a SaaS company, so what is a service? So we basically have applications for human resources and finance. So we manage everything for our customers in our cloud. Um, a few years ago, the, the company decided that uh, based on the uh, number of users that actually were so happy at Word Day, uh, we wanted to move from using just bare metal deployments into virtualization. So uh, they started the journey of uh, putting um, their applications on virtual machines, and they decided to use OpenStack as a cloud management system. So we built uh, an initial private cloud uh, we found a lot of challenge. Um, so we're going to start that our applications are designed to be multi-tenant by itself. So one bare metal server actually provides information from multiple tenants, which basically when they share the same networking, we need to have a way to secure that these two virtual machines in the same virtual networking cannot talk between each other. That's the best way to define a security group for um, some of you that are not that familiar with that uh, networking concept. In our use case, um, we have a very few number of tenants, but a very large number of security groups. Uh, such point that actually we have per uh, communication between two VMs up to 35, 38 rules. I'm talking about different uh, communication channels between two VMs that cannot be enabled, and some of them that will be enabled. So it's a, it's a very unique uh, use case. And also, in terms of the security requirements, it's, um, it's very aggressive. We have um, SSL enabled in all the OpenStack endpoints. And we also have SSL enabled in the communication from these uh, processes to the MySQL database, or whatever the database they use, and also to the RabbitMQ. We're using RabbitMQ, so we also enable SSL. Um, you can imagine we manage payroll information, all these confidential information from our customers. So we need to guarantee that everything is secure and we keep it doing it. And so that's probably why they hired you with your networking background, I'm guessing. Uh, well, yes, one of the, one of the biggest problems in, in Neutron is actually um, there was a performance degradation when you increase the number of security groups. Um, so we look for different alternatives and actually we found something that actually fits uh, perfectly what we're looking for. So we start using another open source project which is called Open Control for all the networking part. And it's, is it seamless to the end users of the cloud? Is it like a network administrator that sets up these security groups but it, it's invisible to the end user? So end users never know what the application is running on. Right? It could be a bare metal, could be a virtual machine, could be a container. Uh, that's a little bit the difference between our private cloud and any typical public cloud, right? So they basically they keep having just URLs where they say uh, myapplication.wordy.com. So we have load balances that actually they send into the specific um, place in the data center that actually will fulfill the requirements and they keep happening. The best way to describe it is you power on the, the light, you have light, you don't care where it's coming from. You just like it to have it always running all the time. If that is off and your uh, fridge is going off and your food is going bad, you get really, really upset. Sure. That is what we're trying to avoid for our customers. And so uh, certainly in all of your cases, security is a huge concern. I mean, I can imagine with the number of, uh, of customers that you work with from Deutsche Telekom, there's a lot of uh, data privacy concerns that are, that are always 
kind of consistent in your region of the world. Obviously, eBay does a ton of transactions. Workday handles HR data and personal data from customers. Uh, is Was that a prohibitor from each of you wanting to use AWS? Not necessarily. Um, it depends on user requirements. In some cases, in, in big projects, uh, we are asked to provide AWS or Azure or something else. Um, we prefer to provide our own platforms. That's, that's obvious, but um, it depends. It depends on user requirements. I think if I may take the question, I don't think uh, security is a, is a criteria to choose between public and private cloud because my understanding is that based on what my experience at eBay and looking at the industry, it is more about how much, you, how much have you automated. Uh, if you have a hole that lets a, some person or an entity do something that is not supposed to do, and then that, that can open a lot of things. So it's your maturity level in terms of automation. That is, I think, what is important for security. You could be uh, like, like the, if you take the look at the case of uh, Experian, they had, I'm sure they had a ton of firewalls and security experts in the world, but they had a leak for two years that nobody could find out. I think, so my bet is that it's about automation, whether you're using public cloud, private cloud, that's not really the point. It's about automating and making consistent standardized setup for your things. With it, no exceptions. It, it seems like a few years ago there were some concerns about taking customer data and putting it out in a public cloud. Like it's a multi-tenant environment, noisy right. neighbors, you know, less control, black box, you're not sure where it's running, who you're sharing with, who has access to those kinds of things. I think we've come away a long way from that though in terms of public cloud utilization. I think so. It's it's like it's like you have a you, the tendency has been in the past was you know you put a firewall at the, at the at the front of the room, but inside everybody can see everything. So if you let one guy in, that guy can steal. At that mindset is now changing. So instead you're worried about point to point uh, trust and confidentiality of data. So for us the the answer to your first question is yes or not. The first part is yes because we actually leverage a lot of Amazon Web Services for development and only development. We actually have tools who can emulate and simulate uh, tenant information into the Amazon Web Services. And that's the way to, uh, our application developer uses to add, fix, etc. cetera. Uh, in production, tenant information never leaves our premises. It's always in our private cloud. We keep it very secure. Uh, we have uh, two layers of security. We have up to three layers of bastions to actually get into the data center. I, um, in my role as an operations architect, I don't have access to tenant information at all. It's probably better that way, huh? Oh yeah, right. For, for I will be there. leaking, I will be leaking. <laughs> uh, talking about the security, it's not only about uh, security in general, it's about data privacy as well. So there are a lot of customers that which prefer to have their data stored in German data centers with respect to German data privacy laws. Um, and that's a common requirement that we have. It seems much more so, and you know, with the, with the recent rulings around uh, some of the, the harbor, uh, was safe harbor stuff yeah. that was going on? We, it's an unclear situation now. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like uh, that's gonna be an, an ongoing thing. And when we talk to our, our counterparts in Europe, I mean, that's the number one thing is data sovereignty, making sure that the data stays in the country, never goes out. Which, you know, at, at some point, it can be difficult, especially if you're using SaaS services and you're not sure you know, where those endpoints are. So uh, talk to me about uh, kind of what you're doing above the stack. You know, I know you are a big proponent of automation. You know, you have your, uh, I forgot what your acronym is that you used on your website, but you've got like an acronym that you use and it's a process that you, 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 that you uh, have folks in your organization follow. I mean, uh, I mean, the thing about the way we are approaching the about the, sorry. The way we are approaching about cloud is, uh, I think uh, if we, uh, if our strategy pans out and if we do the right things in a year, in, if sometime in future, we want to make the cloud disappear from customers. In the sense that, uh, because the way we have approached cloud in the industry, it's OpenStack included, is that you have these APIs that you give out to your customers and they put together, whether they are admins or platform developers, they put together infrastructure, right applications. But I think uh, oftentimes they are not able to make the uh, applications resilient to failure. Uh, we are expecting them to do it, 
And in fact, if you look at OpenStack, OpenStack doesn't have all the building blocks to make apps resilient. AWS has somewhat more complete portfolio, others to a lesser extent. So I think that problem ha hasn't been working out well for in, in, in the industry today. So we want to find out patterns where the resiliency is built into the infrastructure, into the, into the platforms we provide to our customers, whether it's through PaaS layers or, or something else, Kubernetes, cluster management, those kind of things. I think, to me, that's the next evolution of cloud in general. I think that's where we are betting a lot. OpenStack remains. It still provides the building blocks for, for that layer, but it is that layer that, that hides customers from infrastructure failures. That's how we see it. No doubt the, you know, in traditional sort of VMware environments, that resiliency happened at the infrastructure layer. Now, you know, with vMotion and Heartbeat and other things, like, you know, shared storage was a thing. Now it's like you, you have to fund for failure, but how many people are actually doing that? Like, how do you get your users to develop against failure when it's not automatic, especially if they've been developing on a VMware environment? So we, uh, so something that I can share about that is uh, we created a project that we call it Gourmet. It's um, on the top of the stack. It's actually a project that um, helps the developers to, by a simple API, upload their application package into the cloud. They don't need to know about Glance. They don't need to, go to know about Cinder or Netron or OpenStack at all. They just have a simple API to say, my app is ready, put it there, and I want to use it. And, um, and it's full automated. Um, so actually, for, for the project that we're leading in, inside of um, the cloud engineering team at Worthy, it's called WPC, uh, World of Private Clouds. Uh, with uh, the, the Gourmet project, what we ended up having is um, between uh, 300 and 400 VMs daily being created from a golden VM that it was uh, deployed that morning by the Gourmet team automatically. All the applications developer jump in, validate all the changes that actually they created, and we drop it at the end of the day. And we do these sometimes even like two, three times in, in one day. So you were asking before about how many VMs rounds uh, uh, per time could be like, I don't know, 500, 600, it doesn't matter anymore. It's the ability to be able to create and delete all those VMs dynamically, everything keeps running. Um, all the time. And we've seen, uh, certainly, you know, one of our, our customers, Tapjoy, the, the reason why they did you know, Hadoop on OpenStack is because they wanted that ability. Provision, tear it down, provision, tear it down, provision, tear it down. Are you seeing any, any internal uh, requests for big data platforms on OpenStack? I mean, uh, yes, we are looking at ways of consolidating infrastructure. Uh, to, today, uh, typically in most organizations, your Hadoop runs from differently from the rest of the application deployments, and we are looking for ways to consolidate. I think we haven't found uh, made all the choices yet, but I think that's something we are looking at. Um, to be fair, we are not that far with respect to OpenStack and these services on OpenStack. Um, we offer various services to our customers, but we are also a, a VMware fabric, so um, a mm -hmm. factory. Um, so um, we have developer paths, we have big data services, we have SAP, all this stuff. Um, but on the other hand, we have a lot of customers that uh, think conservative. They have applications developed over 20 years and um, there is no return on investment to completely rewrite this application for a cloud native approach, for example. And um, if you would deploy all these applications on OpenStack, um, the stability or resiliency might be lower than on a traditional cloud system. Um, so you have to migrate together with your customer the application into another model, step by step, for example. And then you could introduce all these new services or could use a developer pass and all this stuff. Um, it depends because there is no this customers, uh, this customer. It's a huge corporation like automotive uh, from the automotive industry, for example, and you have to find the right department. We have one uh, project together with, with a, um, a huge company and they are developing their end customer applications on a developer pass on our platform, but they would never do this with production applications or um, core applications they are hosting on our vCloud, for example. 
So it's a step-by-step -step approach to bring the customer into the new world on OpenStack, for example. Which is interesting because I feel like you've been there for a while. Yes, actually, I want to challenge what we also you also mentioned before. Is that you know are we moving away from infrastructure being resilient to the application tier being resilient? I think I think I think what has been happening, if you look at it, is that the rate of change in organization has, has been growing. The rate at which apps are getting changed, deployed every day, has been growing consistently. Like years ago, eBay was doing bi-weekly, two weeks, every, there was release day. Everybody sits down and then pushes code to the site. That's no longer the case. I can deploy it now, I can deploy it tonight, in the breakfast, any time I can deploy. So when the rate of change is so high, things fail faster, naturally, because you're inter introducing regressions and, and you're touching both the control plane and data plane, and that's where uh, the traditional models of expecting infrastructure to remain solid are breaking apart because you're changing it so frequently. So you have to make the software take care of the failures more than in the past. I don't think it's about VM motion versus uh, something else. It is, it, is, it is the rate of change that is causing this problem. Like our OpenStack cloud changes much more rapidly. Like the teams here, they are deploying code to OpenStack every day and our customers are deploying code on that on VMs and, and, and using blocks and block storage, object storage, and so on. So it change everywhere. I think that is what is happening now. Are, are you seeing that rate of change now that your Workday cloud is up and running? Um, I would like to break the protocol here, so I'm going to ask the question now. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because Sue will say something very important. So I, I, I noticed that everybody, like, when they're talking about performance and HA and all those crazy things, um, they just focus on the control plane. And if you, th if you think about a typical data center, when you get a phone call in the middle of the night, it's because the data plane is down. It's because the, the, the user who is trying to use the application is not able to reach. It's not about not creating a VM in the middle of the night. Who creates a VM, not a container in the middle of the night? It's about the traffic that you're sending to the, to the data, right? Well, that's... <laughs> I we think know he does. <laughs> I think those those guys right there do. So <laughs> my, my point is like, how could, how, how, I mean, you put a lot of effort in managing that you have a very good HM model because you're so worried about the control plane. What do you do about your data plane? How do you make sure that your data plane is up and running all the time with everything now is virtualized? So So that's my question now. I think yeah. I think this is actually an interesting, uh, interesting debate. I think make it more exciting to have this. Yes, a debate. Uh, because at the end of the day, you need something to fight. I think I think what has uh, this is my gain. Uh, I want to contradict uh, Edgar's point here. Is that I think with the way uh, the cloud has been going on, data plane uh, expectations are not as high as they were before. Our promise, for example, is that we take the model of public clouds in, in eBay as well. Uh, we promised you that you are able to, there is enough capacity that you're able to provision, move traffic. That means these are all control changes, like an operator is moving, failing over a data center. That means he's touching a load balancer, he's, config, he's changing its configuration. So the configuration, the need for high HA config changes has increased because there is an expectation that things are failing, we need to change quickly. You've given talks on the subject of aging. What do you think, Gerd? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's really changing the the expectation on on the data plane. Um, do, are you finding that your application users are? Is it become more, obviously you guys have been doing this for a while, so is it automatic now that they, they just need to be able to automate around failure? Or is there, are you making it easier by putting in some kind of layer as, as Edgar's team does where it's handling that, that HA for you? Like do you need to serve that to the developer or should you leave it up to the developer to handle no, it? Absolutely, it is, it is some platform that is, <laughs> that is using the capabilities in the control plane. It's not the end developer definitely. But you still need that that flexibility. Like it is often our operations teams that are doing this failover. They need that knob, so the button needs to work. So, in the case of the public clouds, obviously they need to be worried about the the control plane, right? Because they actually open the APIs for their users. Their customers trying to create 
uh, virtualization. They try to create uh, uh, virtual machines and you be in the shoes of a, um, a customer. Um, you're trying to create a VM and put some stuff there, run in and, and then destroy it and blah, blah, blah. And you get frustrated because you try five times and out of those five times, three of them didn't work. You say, this this is not working. You don't even test the data plane, so who cares about the data plane at that point? So the control plane doesn't work, you just throw it away, you go to the next um, to the next vendor. Um, when you control in a private cloud all the control plane, you prepare your actually data center with all the VMs and the weather flexibility that you want it. What you worry most is actually that your data plane is at the highest performance that you ever think about it. One of the major concerns of word data actually moving into virtualization is the performance degradation that we have moving in from the bare metal to the VM. We get uh, between 15 to 20% performance degradation just because of that um, virtualization layer. While we test on containers, we get less than 3% of performance degradation. So that's our way to go now. Nice, so containers, what technologies are you are you using currently? We're, we don't have it in production yet, but we're testing um, Docker containers, yes. Docker, are, are you doing containers as well? This is another container talk, hey. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, sure, yes, yes, we are looking at it. I think, again, uh, it's in the context of, uh, we're not looking at containers as replacement for virtual machines or bare metal, but we are looking at containers as a as a way to better implement cluster management using Kubernetes. <coughs> I think is, that, is, that is our driver. Containers, you could have done last year, but we were waiting on getting the right cluster management uh, model ready in the industry. Are you seeing any demand for containers yet? Yeah, I service? saw an, an announcement last week that um, on our internal build systems, containers are available for the developers for testing. Um, we don't have it in production. We are using Docker in, in this system. Um, but there is uh, development in this direction. So I think in a few months we will have something that we could use in, in, on our platforms as well. It doesn't matter how awesome the containers could be. VMs are not going away, by the way. So they're going to be there. They're going to stay. They need to coexist some, some way. Even the bare metal, right? This is why we have ironic because we found that actually we still need things running on bare metal. And a it, couple it of weeks like ago. Even if you did though, there wouldn't be enough people who knew how to deploy on them anyway, right? It's still such a new technology. I think there's still people who are trying to make the transition from bare metal just to <laughs> cloud in general. Like, you know, how, how, what percentage is the technology change? In what, what is the breakdown of in moving to cloud between the technology change versus like the cultural change within your organizations? I heard this from the director of infrastructure. If it works, don't touch it. <laughs> okay. You can imagine how difficult it's actually to make a change in the in the infra systems. Um, it's very scary. Um, we have SLEs with the with the customers and we have like uh, and what is it's like very crazy. We have uh, per month, I think it's just max of four hours of downtime. And if we break those four hours, actually we start paying back to the customer, something as crazy as that. So um, it's very scary for the infra teams to introduce any kind of changes. Um, and they have to be worried because these guys are the first line of defense um, in terms of something is not working and they really woke up in the middle of the night and they get into uh, pajamas into the knock room and actually trying to fix things as soon as possible. That's true for us as well. Um, the whole organization tried over decades to prevent failure. And now the, one of the, the paradigms of, of cloud is, yeah, you will have failures, but you have a massive amount of VMs, for example, to, to fight that. Um, that's contradictory, so it's, it's a problem. It's, 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 a, it's a huge cultural change in all the processes and the organizations. And it's not that easy. And every new technology that's coming up, for example, containers or whatever, um, cloud native applications, for example, it's um, again a cultural change that is needed. I think I think it is an absolutely necessary change because a, an younger organization that's coming up today has the advantage of an older organization that is monolithic and has a huge cultural mindset of no. VMs or a bad or bare metal is great, and I mean it's it's actually going to it may t 
I think these companies will find it harder and harder to survive going forward. I think it's, 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 a, it's there's no... Because they uh, can't keep up with the rate of change, right? Exactly. You, you die. You perish in this business, if not. And I just want to finish with something. I'll say that is what the infra guy was telling. It's not what I think about it. <laughs> I, think, I think what we're building with OpenStack and all the SDN and all these fancy concept is to actually break that concept of not changing because you're afraid things are not going to work. What was, what, was before, what was before a router? It was a big piece of hardware that actually you buy with a very expensive price of money. You put it there. You put another one because it has to be a HA kind of thing. And you don't touch it for ages, right? What is now is a, an API, a Newton API, <laughs> that actually you call there in a simple thing that actually you configure with a couple of seconds and you actually could enable two virtual machines or two containers to actually to talk each other. So things are changing. I mean, that's that's the whole new world of virtual decisions. On the data center, you have uh, the ability to draw a line between what is the physical world and the virtual world. You can actually now manage it, everything that you manage in weeks and the physical layer in seconds on the virtual layer, and that's what we're trying to introduce to the infra teams. How, how are you, what are you doing to get the adoption rates up? Like, did you, at some point, I think you guys pretty much forced people. Is that, is that I mean, accurate? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we get them drunk. We, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to, I think it is, the, it is the automation that helped adoption of cloud at eBay. I think once we put a platform where any developer can log in and deploy his or her app anytime, that just drove the massive adoption because they didn't have to wait that's awesome. Yeah. I, so it's it's more appealing to the I don't freaking want to wait for resources. Yeah. Give me what I need right now. It, it's hard. You know, we talk to customers all the time, and that's the challenge. Is that, you know, they're like, oh, what about my ticketing systems? What about you know all these other things? How are you handling chargeback and billback? I mean, it, it's a buffet right now. <laughs> it's a buffet. All you can eat. <laughs> Sometimes you run out of food and you just wait. <laughs> What, what about you, Edgar? Are you guys doing billback chargeback yet? Uh, no, not yet. Um, I think it's a good idea. I, I like that uh, buffet thing. Um, on the on the convincing part, I think it's it's about showing them uh, how things could actually be be better for their own life, right? How actually could actually improve their own. Uh, processes, uh, forget about the old practices about like, oh, there's a ticket, needs to be approved for ABC, security, BP, blah, 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 and then come back to you, and then you do it. It's uh, speed up a lot of things, and you can actually invest time in learning for, for, for new things. It's just, it's kind of a little natural happening right now. Good, are you seeing the, the adoption rate of cloud really starting to take off? Yes, in general, yes. And what, what are customers topic. wanting to do with it? Is it you're talking about automotive customers? You know, maybe some financial service customers where data sovereignty is a big deal in your part of the world. What are they? What are people wanting to do with cloud? Uh, in general, it's to reduce their costs. That's the first approach cost from my reduction. point of view. Yeah, it's cost reduction, and it's an, on the first step. It's an outsourcing model in many many of the projects, but. After the, the first step, when they adopted uh, cloud technology, cloud processes, um, then they get a step further with uh, new services from the cloud, um, outsourcing more services from, from the internal IT departments to the cloud and to the service providers. So it's um, yeah, a huge, huge wave from my point of view. I, I find it's hard to put a price tag on agility. Like, how do you... How do you describe what the value is of being able to push code, you know, many, many times an hour versus pushing code once every two weeks, for example? Like, how do you... I think it, it is tough to put a number on that, I think, uh, but it is clear that the, the business expects that agility followed by enforcement of security and availability policies. I think the business sees it clearly. <coughs> I mean, it's tough to put a value on that. It's not expected. It's about creating value. And I can uh, steadily create value if I have the development process that allows me to, to do this constantly, daily, on a daily basis. And then the traditional um, process, I have to wait a few weeks, for example. And then I could introduce a new feature, but I have to, again, wait a few weeks to then discuss if it's uh, implemented the right way. Um, that's not very, very fast, and um, the business sees the advantage to, to create value 
steadily and fastly. Are, are you seeing a return yet at Workday? Well, that's the company is based on that. What you just describe it. Um, uh, every Friday night, we push a new patch into the whole data center. Uh, every customer of Word they uses the same version of the software, no matter what. And, and we do patches every Friday night at 6 p.m. There is no downtime. The customers, they didn't, they didn't even realize about it. And um, every uh, thing is two months, we actually do a new release of the whole software. But things keep working the same way. Um, so agility to actually uh, do patches and to actually change the code, it's one of the most for changing the business model, right? In the past, you spend one year, two years, whatever, uh, as a software uh, group, as an application development tube, yeah, you cook your application or your software and you ship it, you sell it, you pay a license for that for two years and then in two years you get a new one and you spend all that. That's an old business. That, that business is, is, is dying. Still there, but from my point of view, it's dying. The new business is what uh, most of these cloud companies is doing, right? You don't care about the software, you don't care about the customization. It's up there, you just use it whenever you don't, you don't need it, you just drop it, stop paying for that. Kind of like Netflix model, if you're familiar with that. Do any of you have any questions in the audience for our, our panelists here? Ooh, you have one. A couple of questions. You have another one. Come on up and, uh, at, does this microphone work? Yes? Test, test. Let me grab him and I'll bring it to you. Yeah, for Subbu. Um, so how much portion of eBay is on OpenStack today? I can't give a specific number, but it is significant. <laughs> OK. So my uh, follow-up questions are, um, can you comment on your uh, issues with scalability and upgradability? I think uh, we, uh, we learned it by trial and error. Uh, we had we have not been able to hit the design limits of uh, our deployments. For example, we designed for a certain number in mind. We are not able to get to that number because we encountered issues along the way with various parts of OpenStack. I think, again, we are probably in the minority because it's not, not everybody has that requirement to hit that limit. Uh, I, I can share offline the numbers, but not in public uh, of those scale limits. But upgradability, I think we had uh, some marathon sessions initially, like upgrades used to be like nightly, and we spend the whole night, hours and hours. Now we're at a point where we can do upgrades. We have upgraded recently all of our AZs to, I think, uh, Zuno, uh, and now we're going to go to the next round of upgrades. They have become more uh, seamless for two reasons. OpenStack is getting better. And we're also getting better as, a, as an organization, maturing in terms of how to do, make changes. to the public. Are you getting to a point where you are hoping that the releases give you a little bit more time in between? Are you skipping releases? We, we are skipping releases, but uh, I think uh, we're also hoping to see the big, uh, the circle, in, the inner circle in the OpenStack, the six, seven projects, uh, slow down and, and become more focused on stability and, and scalability and, and, uh, and, and reduce the rate of change. Or, or do it in a way that doesn't impact existing deployments. Thank you. Uh, I have a question is, uh, if your boss asks you to fix just one issue, the top issue, that only one issue you can resolve from three different companies, what's your biggest pain and what you want to invest to resolve now? I think that's what a lot of people started the cloud will want to know. I gotta think. I gotta think a, li a little bit. Um, uh, the biggest pain point for us, uh, yeah, unfortunately, subgrades. Uh, we got that big problem. Uh, we invest a lot of time on CI, CD. If you are interested, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Talking about that, marketing. Uh, but yeah, upgrades is a big problem, and it's not our fault. It's OpenStack fault, because we keep <laughs> changing. We keep changing the configuration files, the APIs versioning, and all those kind of things. So, uh, at what do we use uh, Chef for uh, uh, you know configuration management? 
And our cookbooks needs to be updated every time that there is a new release. So we cannot do small releases because there is a lot of incompatibility. And then we change the schemas uh, on the on the database, and that's a lot of risk to actually try and just to push things on that. So my manager will be in love with me even more if uh, we fix that. Sounds like you need to find a good partner, you know? <laughs> yes. Just kidding. Yes. I know that Edgar gets a little batty with the vendors harassing him all the time. Uh, I love them all. You love them all. <laughs> good? Uh, depends on the platform where we have the, the issue. Um, so in one case, I would call the partner. Um, that's the easiest way. Um, on the, the OpenStack platform, that is kind of a do-it-yourself um, um, distribution. Uh, then we would have to do it by ourselves. In this team, we had developers, and they had to fix it by themselves. And um, yeah, then they would do it. And on the other hand, we have um, support by the distribution. Um, they would also help us to, to fix the problem, and that's the way to go. And you're the last one, because we're at time. So if I were to fix something, I would reduce choice in OpenStack. I don't mean remove drivers, but at, this, at the core of OpenStack, there are some components that are too many ways of doing things. Five, three databases, like four Neutron. messaging platforms. <laughs> no, I think there is too much. I think some of the choice uh, has moving parts and, and it's more complexity. I would simplify, reduce that, so it becomes easy for us operating in cloud. Thank you so much. How about a round of applause for my awesome panelists? Thank you. You have a talk at 9 a.m. tomorrow, Edgar? Yes, yes, we're going to share CICD and what it is, an awesome talk, actually. Gerd, do you have any talks coming up? Nope. Not this time? Subu? 9, 9 a.m. on Keystone? Yes. Oh, that's oh. going to be a fight now. No, no, don't <laughs> worry. worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, y'all. We should say we are hiring, too. Oh, yes. they're all hiring, by we the way, all, all of them.